I have no idea why it's not letting me in. Well, that's for me. And that's participant invite. Okay. I'm trying to try again. Okay, I just sent I just sent you an invite. Okay, it's recording. You didn't get an invitation? I got it. I'm trying to open it now. I'll send it to you, Matthew and Lawrence. Yeah, you keep it in. Yeah, so that's that's right. Okay, so Matthew Graham should be able to get in there. Yes. Is Carol Landon going to this class? Who's that? Carol Landon. I haven't heard from her in about a week. Okay, I didn't know she was in this class. Before. We're going to give Matthew one more minute if he doesn't start all that way. Yeah, okay.
Okay, who wants to go first? I okay. I'm just here. You're just here? Because I had switched minds in a second. Because we're Until supposed to. I was like, I emailed you a month ago. Please don't make me go because it's going to be real embarrassing. I said it last class. I said it last class. I'm not even ready. I have nothing to work close to my parents. I can talk about how I can talk about real estate. Is the governor still Arnold Schwarzenegger? I have the 20 you were out there. <laughs> I, can, I have uh, 20 sources, though, so I can read the sources about that. No PowerPoint. <laughs> paper review. You just like shoot your paper review. Are you still in the meeting? I exit out. Okay. Because I've been looking for you in here. No, I exit out right when I got in. Nobody, no, I don't I was like, to get this. Do you want to go first? I'll go first. Okay, I think I've printed No, because I just emailed it to you. Well, you can pull it up on here. Yeah. I emailed, I emailed it twice because I just fixed it. You need to sign in in your email. This one? Does that work okay? Yeah, that's fine. I don't think. Let me see if I can. You should be able to go. It's supposed to. No, because he's not. Just go right here. Oh. Look at the technology. Okay. Uh, I think I'll rather go like this. Okay, whatever. whatever you want to show you. Okay. Sorry, we're listening. Oh, you're good. <laughs> All right. So, hello, my name is Javier Gonzalez, and I'm going to talk about higher education in Chile. Uh, it's my entity report. So the first thing that I want to talk about is a little bit of the background of the higher education in Chile and how did everything started. So uh, there was a really old reform in 1980, uh, which had uh, 80 universities, uh, two public universities. One of them was, was and is still called University of Chile and a state technical university and six privates from typical Catholic University of Chile and then at least the remaining five. Uh, most of them are still uh, universities in Chile, uh, but right now the Pontifica Catholica, Catholic University of Chile is a uh, state university, it's not private. Uh, the University of Chile is the most important one. Uh, it's ranked um, worldwide as one of the best universities. Um, so it's still one of the most important ones because it oversees the quality of professional training programs in important fields in the other universities. So these universities, the one that actually oversees all the other universities, either private or, or from the state. Uh, the university started to extend and develop campus around the country. So this is mainly because the major universities were all, all concentrated in the capital of Chile, so Santiago. So the University of Chile was in Santiago and all the important universities were in Santiago de Chile, which is the capital. 
and the other regions, like small cities, didn't have any universities. So most of the people have to, if you wanted to go to school, like to get a degree in higher, like in a university, you had to travel and live in the other city. Um, so, um, so and Chile, and Chile runs the whole western side of yes. South America. So, forgetting my geography, where is Santiago? Where it's is in it? the center. It's in the center. Mm -hmm. So, okay. in the center. So, if you live in the north, you have to like move all the way to the center to be able to go to school. Not anymore. That was before. Um, universities before the universities did not charge tuition aside from minimal matriculation fees. Uh, universities use general tax revenues to um, to pay for the higher education system. And everything changes during the military government when it took place in Chile from 1973 and 1990. Uh, they actually made an entire new reform about the higher education in Chile. So actually they start um, they give the possibility uh, to create institutes and technical training centers, and also they made a lot of private schools. Um, most of the schools that were from the state went all the way to private schools. Uh, so most of the, the education, either higher education or like high school and middle school, were all almost private because Chile was going through a crisis and they needed money. Uh, to get a better economy, so they found that way of getting more incomes. Uh, the number of universities increased to 41 to uh, to 41 by 1989, and they kept increasing all the time because they were uh, the government was asking for money to the central bank bank to be able to build new universities, but all private. So the higher education system nowadays, uh, it's made up of 59 universities, 43 professional institutes, because uh, focused mainly on five years career. So most of the universities in Chile, uh, the majors last for five years, not for like year. Um, that's pretty much because there is a, uh, the education in Chile is not equal for everybody. So, um, some schools have a better system than others. So when you get to the university, they use like the first year to level up the class. That's why you kind of miss one year in your major. That's why it lasts five years actually. Um, so today the private sectors represent a higher enrollment than the one from the crush. Uh, that's the concept of rector of Chilean universities, the one that actually, uh, manage the, all the universities in Chile. Um, and it's not sad, but it's uh, weird that the private sectors represent a higher enrollment because state universities are the old ones, the ones that are supposed to uh, give the best education to the, to the students. So, as you can say, there is more than 4,000 current careers at the level of universities in the country, of which around 900 careers are in the process of, of being closed. This is because there is not enough students enrolling into those majors, or also because they don't have the money to keep uh, the financing going about um, the careers. Also, there is around 400 master programs um, against 100 programs offered by private universities. So the state universities are offering more um, master programs than the private ones. How much tuition do students have to pay? Uh, we'll get there. Okay. So, <laughs> accreditation and enrollment. Um, so there is seven different um, private accreditation agents are the ones that actually accredit every uh, major and the universities. Uh, as it says here, almost all the, how do you say that? 
Pedagogy careers, sorry, I didn't know how to pronounce it. Are created today for periods ranging for from one to seven years. So um, this is happening because most of like um, educa higher education and uh, majors related to education, they are kind of the cheapest one that you can opt to uh, study in Chile. So they keep, uh, finding like new ways to create more educational degrees and that's why they are they are the ones that are being accredited more um, one of the bad sides of this is that there is a conflict of interest that currently exists exists between some private accreditation agents and higher education institutions so there are some uh, mostly private um, higher education institutions that will pay to these agencies too, so they can make, uh, they can accredit more the majors that they have or that they're offering. And the enrollment increased from 7% in 1980 to just over 39% in 19... You say from 7%, 7%. 7% of the population, of the student population. like. Populations between 18 to 18 to 24 years old. May want to change that when we do the report. Say seven percent of the college traditional college population. Okay. Is that Matthew? Okay. Issues with uh, higher education in Chile. This happened because there has been no uh, country policy for the upper level from 1990 to date. So actually the, the policy has, haven't changed at all since 1990. So that's one of the major issues that Chile is facing right now with the higher education. Um, also the, the poor people that cannot afford going to universities, that hasn't changed either and only the richest people actually can opt to go to school, to universities and get a, a degree. So here it says that um, one in six young people from the poorest sector is the one who is accessing the system today. But the richest population, um, five out of six are actually going to the university. Uh, another one of the issues is that um, it's really expensive going to to school and opting to a higher education system. Um, it's really expensive for Chilean society to be able to afford. So the tuition the tuition is about seven thousand dollars a year, but if you think about it, if you say seven thousand here is like nothing, but in Chile, it is a lot of money that most of the people can actually not afford. Um, the tuition over there is different than here because here you have campus and the tuition sometimes include the meal plan, housing, um, your classes. In Chile, the campus is just like the building with the classrooms inside. We don't have a campus with uh, sport facilities or housing facilities. Or like a student center or union that does not exist in the campus in Chile, in the universities. So you actually go to the university, take your classes, and then you leave and have to find your way to live around somewhere close. I was going to say, how do modern income and low income can afford it? Because if they have to move, they have to pay. Mm -hmm. That's the issue that Chile is facing right now with people want to go to the better schools, but most of the people have to that lives in small cities. They have to move to the capital, but they have to find their own their own transportation. So they have to pay for public transportation, which is very expensive. They have to pay for housing outside campus. Uh, they have to cook their own meals and things like that. So uh, that's one of the issues that Chile is facing right now. Uh, positive aspects. 
uh, it has increased in study opportunities. So uh, believe it or not, more people has been able to opt to going to university, but that's because uh, some scholars have been able in the last years. Um, there is a really uh, quick grow in the private education so that gives more opportunities for students that actually have the money to pay to go and opt for another school. Um, there is more access uh, in all aspects, uh, more equal as uh, access. So nowadays, more universities accept uh, different type of um, different people, not different people, but they accept uh, more diversity. So let's say a private school before they didn't give any chance to the poor people uh, to get in, into their school because they didn't offer any scholarships. Nowadays they do offer scholarships so poor people, people that is considered in the lowest um, society in Chile, they can opt to go to these like amazing schools and rich schools. Um, and the development of doctorate programs nowadays is increasing due to international help. Uh, United States has helped in, in some doctorate's degree in the University of Chile. The financing higher education in Chile. So the budget before was about a 32%, but with the new reform and after the military government, right now it doesn't exceed the 15%. So, which means that actually Chile doesn't give that much money to the state universities. So they are missing uh, important resources like uh, labs, books, and important facilities. Uh, so you're saying only 15% of their budget comes from the government? Mm -hmm. Yes. And before it was 32%. Which is still low. Huh? It Which was, still exactly. Low. It's still low, but now it's lower. And my sister graduated from the University of Chile. And you will imagine that it's a great university. This is the best university in Chile. Still, it looks like <laughs> nothing, honestly. The classroom is not even like this, like doesn't even look like this. Um, it looks like really, really old. They don't have good labs. They don't, they don't have like the library is really small, lacking of books and stuff like that. So, and that's why, that's because of the budget. So universities have to find their own strategies to generate sources through different channels, such as increasing the tuition rates, uh, getting loans from banks, and then that what that is what caused a lot of universities to finally close because they can not even keep affording it. So uh, nowadays, all of the students have to pay for fees and tuition by their own. Um, if you don't have the money to pay for fees and tuition, then you cannot up to any financial aid. You can, but here's the thing. You can opt to two different loans, uh, which the, the issue here is that the, they, the interest is 6%. So you get a loan, let's say with $7,000 for the year, or you get a loan for the, with the amount of the entire career, the five years. Uh, so the interest is 6%. So as soon as you graduate, they start charging you 6% of that amount. Uh, who's gonna be able to find a job which is gonna afford, uh, which is gonna give you that much money to be able to start paying so you don't get the interest charge? Nobody. And that's the, one of the, the biggest issues. Uh, I can give you an example, my mom, she just finished paying her loan about three years ago. So it's a lifetime thing that you, because they keep charging you all the time until you're, you're in zero. 
and they charge you a six percent, which is a lot, a lot of money if you actually do the math. Uh, the admission to the higher education in Chile, uh, you have to take the PSU, which is the University Selection Test, which is pretty similar to the SAT. Uh, they also count the NEM, the high school grades, um, which they put it all together and then you get, a, uh, you get a score and with that score you can opt to different universities. And the university selection test, as I say, is really similar to the SAT. It's all multiple questions. You can only opt to take it once a year. So it's kind of, um, um, it's, it's a lot of stress for the student. In, you're actually preparing for this, for, for, for this test since your first year of high school. So they prepare you for that. Uh, you can only take it in December. Everybody, like the entire country, takes it the same day. You have two days to take it, and it, it consists of four tests. Um, two of them you have to take it, and the other two are not mandatory. You can opt to take it, depending on which, um, which major you want to opt to go. So um, the mandatory ones are math and then language and communication, and the other two is science and history. So if, you're up, if you want to go to school and then get a degree in law, or if you want to go to law school, you have to take history. And that's it. When, what, how is the instructional calendar set? We have semesters, yes. and they have some schools that have quarter system, which means yes. uh, they are divided into semesters. Uh, same here. Your semesters run from? Yes, we start classes on March, and then March to December. That's over a year. So we start classes in March, then we have um, we have winter break from July. We have two, two weeks of winter break from July, in July. And then we return to class like at the end of July to December. And then we have summer break from December to March. Does that make sense? I just caught on that it was backwards. I was like, well, yeah, it is like, all summer like, break. Yeah, it is all backwards. <laughs> I got it, yeah, because the Southern Hemisphere. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So but totally it's divided cool. in two semesters. Well, nowadays, Chile is facing up a bad moment and they're protesting a lot. They're missing class. They're not going to, universities are like protesting as well. They're missing classes, so students may not even be able to have. Um, vacations now or any break because of it. Any question? Is it national language? No, it's Hispanic. The only country in South America that speaks Portuguese is Brazil. Really? That's it? <laughs> yeah. Well, Portugal. Yeah. So Brazil. Two Cuba, and they try to imagine things with brain fog and fog. Yeah. That center. Oh, well, I was raised in the north, but then we moved to the center. We moved because of my sister. She wanted to go to the big universities, so she got into university. She got like a really good score in the, in the test. She was able to make it, so it was either she moved by herself or all of us, all of us moved. So we all moved. What I'll do is I'll read over your, uh, your handout. Plus, you still have your paper submit. And uh, I can give you some word assistance with the translate. Like for you using the word against. And I know why, because it's, that's what it translates to from Spanish, compares to it's either yeah. comparing it against something. So just okay. little things like that. Nothing, nothing, nothing big. Um, when you said the degree programs are five years mm -hmm. at the universities. Yes. What about vocational schools or tech, technological So schools? technological schools are usually two years. Two years only. Um, they opt to go to the university, but if you opt to go to university, you actually have to do start all over again, so you have to do five years. 
um, to universities are five years. It depends as well. Like med school is like eight years as well. Law school is like eight years, um, which is different in Chile. Here you go to pre-med, get a degree like four years, and then you go you apply to med school, right? In Chile, you as soon as you finish high school, you can apply for med school, but that's eight years in a row. Is that pending in your score? Yes, you have to get the highest one, most likely. Unless you wanna to go to a private school, which they don't ask for a like, really high score, but um, it's really expensive. Yeah. What's the uh, currency name down there? Like we have dollars. Oh, pesos. Pesos. What's the exchange rate like? What would an American dollar be worth in? Uh, it's it's funny because uh, one dollar uh, one dollar is seven hundred pesos. So yeah, so I'm it's, trying to get a feel for like the cost of living. Like, what would uh, it's really different. Like if, if something yeah something would would it cost there as compared to here? Uh, I don't. It's not about like, let's say, if you want to buy a Coke, a drink, it's almost the same thing. It's just how much you get paid at the end, at the end of the month. Uh, in Chile, you get paid about, like the minimum wage is $350. No, I'm lying, 400, 500, let's say 500. Um, you don't get paid uh, when you work by hours, you get paid like in a minimum rate uh, wage. So that depends on the company that you work in. But the minimum wage is like five hundred dollars a month. So with that, you have to be able to pay for school, pay for rent, food. What's an average? Depending where you work, like you work at McDonald's, like that's where you could be expected to make. Like, you know, you're not make that. <laughs> You are not gonna make more than that. Like people that work at McDonald's, they're not gonna make ma more than five hundred dollars. Right. Uh, but there is a lot of people that actually like don't earn nothing but five hundred dollars, even if you have like a degree or. Whatever. So it's not like a starting rate. You move up. You just like there. Yeah. It's either like the difference is huge because it's either that or you get like 8,001. So there is like poor people, rich people, and that's it. There's not, there's not, there's there's not, not a big middle class. Uh, there's, there's not a big middle class. <laughs> What's the major farm products that come out of Chile? I know wines. <laughs> wines, uh, copper. Yeah, I'll say that. Copper is the main one. And they have cold weather up in the mountains. So most people live between the mountains and the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. Like in the mountains, you can get snow, but not in the sea. So it is really cold. You look at the mountains and you can see how it's snowing, but it will never come down to the cities. So if you live like in the edge of the mountain, then yeah, you may get the snow in your house, but not if you live like in the city. That's weird. Well, the first university in the Western Hemisphere was the University of Peru. It closed eventually, but that was the first one. I'm trying to think where Chile, Chile wasn't too far behind. I have it in the report when it was okay. All right, any other questions? No. Thank you. Let's close that out and see who's trying. To. Is somebody there trying to get in? Yeah, I made, it. I made it. Okay, just one second. Let me let me close this email stuff that's on the screen. There you go. Finally, nice to meet you. Finally. Are you ready to present? Yes, sir. I'm ready. He's not even looking at me. I was going to wait at him. Okay. Well, can I don't know if you can see the folks that are in, that are in. No, I can't. I can't see them. I didn't realize he started this semester. Yes. That's Sydney Richardell. Yeah, I hear it. I hear it. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. Well, we're ready to hear you report. You're reporting on your book. Um, yes, sir. Y'all ready? Yeah, the grind. I'm, I'm passing down your. Okay. All right. So the book report that I did um, was a book that I read um, whenever I was a freshman in college. Uh, it's called The Grind. Um, it's by Eric Thomas. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So a little bit about the author. Um, Eric Thomas grew up in the city of Detroit. Um, he had an extremely rough home life. Um, he argued with his uh, parents a lot. Um, oh, now we get to look at everybody. Uh, so uh, he argued with his parents a lot. He lived on the streets um, after he uh, finished arguing with his parents. He lived on the streets for more than two years. Um, the turning point in his life uh, was when he uh, met a preacher when he was about 13 years old uh, who urged him to go back and finish school. Uh, now, and now he's one of the most well-known motivational speakers around the world, and he's the author of this book. Um, so I'm going to start talking about the book review content. So Eric states that this book, it can be used by a step, it can be used as a step-by-step -step process on being success, successful in today's world. Uh, he wrote that he wrote this book in first point, person point of view um, to convince the reader that no matter what we go through in life, uh, if we wake up the next day, we're truly blessed. Um, the writing of this book is mostly informal, and I think he did that so he would make the reader feel comfortable reading um, so that they could set their own goals um, for their own successful lives. Um, the first two chapters are basically building blocks, and I noticed um, with reading the book that each chapter basically built on itself um, to truly give you a step-by-step -step process on being successful. Uh, starting the grind and examples of grinding are the first two, um, while the last two chapters are performance and excellence, which truly show how they translate. Um, the intention of this setup is so that someone can be successful in uh, every aspect of life. Um, there are a total of 12 chapters and they average around 45 pages per chapter. Um, so it's really not that intensive of a book. Um, the overall theme of the book is that success can be found at every level of your life. Um, the author's thesis is that being successful isn't always about the money. Um, it's about living life to the fullest and taking advantage of every opportunity that you're given. Um, one of my personal favorite quotes from the book is, when you want to be successful, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, that's when you'll be successful. Um, that's probably his most famous quote um, that he's ever known for because um, it really hits deep. Um, the narration of the chapters showed the development of Eric as a young man, I mean a young boy, and how he developed over the course of his life. Um, so he discusses um, studies done by professors and uh, scholars across the world. It's called a grit scale. Um, so a grit scale is a questionnaire that was de developed to study factors related to higher achieving individuals. So what this basically means is the study was done to find what makes certain people want to be successful at every level. Um, so you can try to translate that to the, um, you could say the individual that wants to be successful. So they did a lot of studies trying to figure out what truly makes um, Bill Gates, people like that, what made them truly want to come up with these uh, comprehensive ideas to be successful. Um, the second chapter of the book is one of the most important parts. He discusses that the start um, to be successful requires the largest effort. And then he gives examples of a bunch of different accomplished individuals um, and how they had little to nothing whenever they started and how they now are multimillionaires and they have developed their companies um, even when people told them that to give up. Um, and that translates into the next uh, slide. He says that uh, never give up is the next chapter. Um, and he discusses that on the path to, path to success, um, you will go through failures, but it's not um, about what you do with those failures, it's about how you learn from them. Um, so you don't make that same mistake twice. Um, doing what others won't is the next chapter. And um, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. It's pretty, pretty much saying that if you do want to be successful, sometimes you're going to have to um, do stuff that other people won't want to do. Um, 
Somebody, somebody sent me a message saying that they can't see or hear anything. 